This morning, we're going to begin a new series looking at the all too forgotten third member, as we normally do that, the triune God. And speaking of the Trinity, we often refer to the Trinity as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a lot of preaching and teaching that takes place, churches, Bible studies, and small groups, that one of the main focuses is God the Father. Another main focus is usually Jesus Christ the Son, but all too often that Holy Spirit, third in the Godhead, the Holy Trinity, is forgotten, or it's not preached on. In the final moments of Jesus' time that he has with the disciples, he's telling them, I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you a helper, another helper, he says, that is going to be there to help you. We know that that helper is the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit. It is in John chapter 14. Where we are going to be this morning, our passage is John 14, beginning in verse 15, and read all the way through 17. That this morning we would, we would have a revelation of the promised helper that is the Holy Spirit that is declared over our lives as the church. As Jesus is speaking to the disciples, but the message that is here are for those that follow him today as well. The Holy Spirit then grants to us power to love Jesus Christ to obey Jesus Christ, and to bear witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. So John 14, beginning in verse 15. If you love me, this is Jesus speaking, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let us once, once again go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, I pray if you have it already that you would humble our hearts. Lord, that in this moment we are reading the very word of God that came forth from the mouth of your Son and fully inspired by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would not take that for granted. But with all of our hearts, with all of our mind, with all the love that we have, Lord, we would pour ourselves into your word and that we would live in it. Not only in this moment, but every single moment of our lives, we would live in your word. What we gather what we gain from the insight of your spirit will be written on our hearts. That in every moment of our lives or whenever we are faced with grief, sorrow, or trouble, or that it would be your word that comes forth from our hearts and to our mind, or that we are reminded of your promises. So this morning I pray that you would move me aside. And that your Holy Spirit would teach. And that your word that is sharper than any two-edged sword would cut through us deeply. Counselor, comforter, advocate, and helper. We call on you, Father, in the name of the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we dive deeper into this passage, we must step back. You find that in the previous chapter, Jesus has been foretelling, he's been telling his disciples, I'm going to leave. And all this time he's telling them, I'm going to be put to trial. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be put to trial. I'm going to, be, I'm going to, I'm going to have to suffer. And I'm going to be put to death. And of course, Peter's standing up and he's like, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen. There's no way that's going to happen. And Jesus is like, Peter, if you only knew, like, you're going you're gonna to not deny me. You're going to say you don't even know me. And all of this, you can see through the reaction of Peter and Jesus being able to look into the hearts of man, looks into the heart of those probably 11 men that are there right now, 
possibly Judas there also. But looking into the hearts of his disciples and seeing and knowing that they are greatly troubled by what is being said and what Jesus is telling them. That he is going to die. This is a big deal because they've relied on Jesus for the last three years. They've relied on him for everything. What it is that they, where it is that they would go, what it is that they would teach, what it is that they would eat, where it is that they would lay their heads, whose home they would go to, whose homes they would not go to, all of this and the discernment that was given to them by Jesus Christ and the discernment that was given to Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. They relied on Jesus for so much and then they're finding out he's leaving them. And they're troubled by this. What are we going to do now? Where are we going to go? Where's our provision? In the beginning of chapter 14, we know they're greatly troubled because Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe. He says, believe in the Father, believe in me. And beginning in that verse, moving forward, we find through verses 1 through 14, Jesus is giving them comfort, giving them words of encouragement. We find this comfort in promises that he is saying to them. See, we step back into Scripture and we find that, that the relationship that God has with his people, we step back and we look at the church of the Old Testament. We look at Israel. We find that God had a covenantal relationship with them. It was a relationship that was based on promises from God, and then from the people, faith. Promises from God and from the people, faith. And part of that faith was loving God and obeying His commandments. This covenantal, these covenantal relationships that God had with His people didn't stop in the Old Testament. We see that Jesus continues that with the church of the New Testament. And it moves from the church of Israel so now those that are of Israel, but also the Gentiles as well. And all of that is forming, all of that is shaping, coming into shape right now in this moment when Jesus, through these three years, is teaching, preaching, and leading his disciples to the moment to where he is leaving them. And he's giving them these promises. These promises are huge. Carrying over this covenantal relationship that we find God having with his people. And the intention there is that they would not lose hope. That their hearts would not be troubled in this time while they are in a troubling world. And Jesus promises that he goes to prepare a place for them. We find that in the first portion of this chapter. That he goes to prepare a place for them. There's one promise. He also promises that the disciples will do great works. Actually, he says that you'll do greater works than I have done. Jesus is telling his disciples that they will do greater works than with the works that Jesus Christ has done. And he also promises them that whatever they ask in the name of Jesus Christ, that it will be done for them. Comfort. Encouragement. When we ourselves, the church today, examine these promises and know that they transcend time to meet us here. The same promises that were given to the disciples in John chapter 14 are given to us as well. It's in verse 16 where we find the promise of a helper. But before we get to the promise of a helper, we must understand the qualifications of those who are being given that promise. Jesus says in verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in this line, Jesus is revealing to us the characteristics of a true believer, a Christian. That you would love Christ, and in loving Christ, you would keep his commandments. His commandments cannot be kept unless love exists for him. The clear indication of one who is not a disciple of Christ would be that they do not love him and therefore do not adhere to his word. And usually that's clearly evident in the world today. It's also a common theme that we find throughout the book of John is that you would love and obey. Love first 
Obey comes after. They go hand in hand. We find it here in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We find it also in verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. In verse 24 or 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. In 24, he flips it around and says, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. This qualification here of a disciple is that he or she loves Jesus Christ. And in loving Jesus Christ, he or she keeps his word, keeps his commandments. And all of the, pro- the promises that are listed there, verses 1 through 4 and 16, and all the promises that are to come, they all hang on this one qualification, love and obey. But I don't stop there. I go back to previous passages of Scripture. I go back to previous chapters. I go back to previous books, all the way to the Old Testament. And you find that the covenant that God made with Abraham hangs on this one qualification. Love and obey. The promise that God made with David hangs on that one qualification. Love and obey. The promise for Adam. The promise for Noah. Love and obey. Love God and obey His commandments. Jesus, being one with God, says, love me. They know of the Scriptures. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment. Jesus is saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. Also, you love the Father and you love me. And if you love me, you keep my word. And my word is in line with the Father's word. We are one and the same. Verse 16 is where we find a promise for true believers, for those who love and obey Him. It's in verse 16 that we have a promise of the Holy Spirit. And here's how it reads. It says, And I will ask the Father, Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever. The first aspect of this promise that really jumps out to me from the start is that Jesus is going to the Father to ask the Father for the Holy Spirit for the disciples, for believers. So this is Jesus interceding. And I hope that that sounds familiar because last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we were reading from Isaiah 53, verse 12. And it says in Isaiah 53, verse 12, that the servant of God, who is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that the servant of God makes intercession for those who are accounted righteous. That it's a continual intercession that happens and we see it here happening Here, for the disciples, here, centuries later, from Isaiah 53, Jesus in this moment is saying to them, and it's a promise, I'm going to go to the Father, and I'm going to intercede on your behalf. I will speak to the Father of you by name, as those who love and obey my word. And I will say to the Father, I will ask of the Father, give them this helper. Jesus continually interceding for believers. Even in the act of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And here's what's so beautiful about that. The Father working. The Son working. The Holy Spirit working. We see it all in those first few words of verse 16. All of the triune God moving in this moment. Jesus interceding to the Father and the Holy Spirit being given to believers. The beautiful harmony as the redemptive plan continues to be revealed. Jesus states that God will give, as in a gift, will give another helper. And we'll start with that word helper, then we're going to go back to another. Because these are very important words. This word helper in the Greek, the original language, it carries a lot of meaning. Some of you, if you've got a translation there that's different, you might find that it says comforter. And that's not wrong. That's an appropriate translation. But when we look at the word helper, there's so much more weight that is carried with it. In the original language, I don't want to lose you guys, but uh, parakleton is the word that is used there for helper in Greek. It means advocator, intercessor, Consoler, comforter, 
and helper. Five things with one word. It's why English is so dull. But with one word, so much meaning. And if it's being used as a verb, it means one who is called to one's aid or called to one's aid. As a verb, it means you are called to one's aid. We understand it in the meaning. We see so much deeper the relationship that the Holy Spirit has with believers. First, as advocate, we know that the Holy Spirit pleads to the Father on our behalf. He is advocating for us. Also, as intercessor, the Holy Spirit prays to the Father on our behalf. He is continually interceding with groanings that we don't even understand. That our spirit communing with the Holy Spirit knows what we need and asks that of the Father. And then as consoler, the Holy Spirit alleviates grief and sorrow of this world that may overtake the believer. As comforter, the Holy Spirit reassures and brings relief in times of trouble and affliction for the believer. And then as helper, the Holy Spirit is all thee and above. All thee above and more. And here's what I mean by that. When I say all the above, it's a, it's a fun little play on words. Because with the Holy Spirit, we have the presence of God. See, all the above of heaven, where God's presence is, in spirit, God being there, described as pure light there in heaven. But we have a glimpse of that here with the Holy Spirit, but not only the Father, but also the Son. The Holy Spirit within us is all the above. That is our glimpse of the relationship goal. That's what heaven is. It's, a rela- it's, it's the full coming together of the triune God, and you are there in that presence. In this body, we can't handle that. There's no way we can handle that. That's why there's going to be a resurrection of the saints where we're given new bodies. Because in this moment, what we can handle, barely even handle, is the presence and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. Because we, man, we can't even fathom barely the power of the Holy Spirit that is within us. It is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. It is in us. That is the power that is dwelling within us. And that relationship goal that we have is to be with the Father, to be with the Son, to be with the Spirit in one place, that same place that Jesus was promising the disciples in the previous verses. He is there preparing that place for us. Then there's a reason why Jesus says another helper. Once again, in the Greek language, there are two words being meant by another. One of those words for another in the original language means completely different. Another being not the same. But that's not the word that Jesus is using here. When he says another, it's the Greek word that means exactly the same. So when Jesus says, I'm leaving you, but what I'm going to leave for you is a helper who is just like me, one and the same. And he's going to help you as we're reading this. He is going to help you in the same way we read that Jesus would be helping them. Because they relied on him a lot. Like I already said, they relied on him so much. But now they have the assurance that in his physical absence, that they will be given the Spirit of God to be there in the place of Jesus Christ. One and the same. We have a hard time wrapping our head around how that would work. But the spirit within being teacher, guide, the, the, the provider, the, the provision, counselor, consoler, leader, advocate, intercessor, all these things and so much more. In essence, they would be losing nothing but gaining more. And the reason why I say gaining more is because Jesus said to them in a promise that they would be doing greater works than Jesus did. 
They would be healing the sick. They would be bringing people back to life. Well, that sounds like what Jesus did. You're exactly right. That is what Jesus did. Jesus came that He would turn the sons of Israel back to the Father. And then what He is doing with the Holy Spirit, communing with the disciples and dwelling within the apostles, is that they are going out and preaching and teaching and growing the church of Jesus Christ that is not only for the Jew, but it is also for the Gentile. And the expansion of the Gospel goes well beyond the three years when Jesus was on the earth. I'm not saying that that Jesus didn't do great work. He did do great work. But in the words of Jesus Christ to the disciples, He tells them, you are going to do greater work than these things. And we do see the expansion of the Gospel and the church because of the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Those hands and feet are the disciples. That it started to grow into the church that it is today. And none of these things would have been possible if it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit within them. But another aspect of them gaining more is that the Spirit, as we read here in verse 16, that the Spirit would remain within them how long? Forever! Can we wrap our minds around forever? Forever? Endlessly, without end, through eternity. From that moment of the, of the Holy Spirit falling upon the disciples at the time of Pentecost, through eternity, they have the presence of the Holy Spirit forever. We have a hard time wrapping. It's it's endless. It will never end. Forever is what Jesus says. And this is huge because you look back at Scripture and you find it wasn't like that. The, The Holy Spirit would fall upon someone and do great work through that person and then the Holy Spirit would be gone. That's why David prays in the Psalms. He says, Lord, let not your spirit depart from me. David knew what it was like for that spirit to be upon him. Don't let your spirit depart from me. And then hear the promise of the helper who is the exact same as Jesus Christ. Jesus has given that promise that that spirit will never depart from you. And we go on to verse 17. Jesus says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Prepositions are very important. Prepositions are very important. It tells us where something is. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. Next week, we're going to go into greater detail about what that spirit of truth means. But for today, we have revealed to us that the source of truth for the disciples is found in the Holy Spirit. Not to get too far ahead of myself in this uh, sermon series. We will find John 16, 13, that it is the Holy Spirit who guides the disciples into, guiding them into, like walking through a door or walking into a room. Guiding them into all truth. All truth. And declares to them the things that are to come. So in in the Sundays ahead, we will learn more about the role of the Holy Spirit in writing the New Testament. But for today, the Spirit is the source of truth for all true believers. For those who love Jesus Christ and obey His commandments. So Jesus tells his disciples that the spirit of truth cannot be received by the world because the world does not see him or know him. And here's how we've seen this play out in the Gospels. To help us understand what Jesus is saying, we find at the birth of Jesus Christ, when he he came into the world, uh, that Mary conceived Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, We know that, the, the fun Christmas story, the nativity and all those things. When Jesus was baptized... 
John knew who the Messiah was because of the revelation of the Holy Spirit falling as a dove upon the Son of God, the Lamb, the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. The fulfillment of the Spirit falling as a dove. Then Jesus declares that the works that He has done, all of the works that He has done, every miracle, every sign, that He did it through the power of the Holy Spirit, even resurrection, His resurrection, was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives credit to the Spirit of God. But what does the world say? But what does the world say when they see these things? You know, they would mock Jesus and say, who's your father? Or they would mock John the Baptist. Who, who, who do you think you are, Elijah? Or you're, you're, you're bringing forth Elijah? Or they mocked Jesus in his death with the intention of burying him with criminals. What does the world say when they look at the signs that are pointing to Jesus as deity, when they are pointing to Jesus as the Son of God and the Son of Man from the book of Daniel? Here is what the world says. In Matthew 12, 24, the Pharisees declare that it was by the work of Beelzebub that Jesus performed those miracles. And in that moment, they spoke blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because they did not see the Holy Spirit. Because they didn't see Jesus for who He truly was. And they didn't know the Spirit because they didn't know Jesus for who He truly was. Instead, they would rather say, this is the work of the devil. And in that moment, we find that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit would not be forgiven. They had clear revelation of who Jesus is through what He was doing, through what He was saying, and even then they could not see clearly because they did not truly know Him. They did not love Him and they were not going to keep His Word. Jesus continues on to say to the disciples, you know Him for He dwells with you. Or, in other words, He abides with you. Makes an abode. Makes an abode. A dwelling place. And how could this be? It's because they have been in the presence of the Spirit of God from the very beginning when they were walking with Jesus. They were walking with the Spirit of God. And if they knew Jesus, then they knew the Spirit of God. If they saw Jesus, then they saw the Spirit of God. This is how it is possible that they would even know the Father because they know Him. That, tri that Trinitarian relationship laid out right here within these three verses. And we have a hard time wrapping our head around it, but we take it on faith. And we see it right here in only three verses explained for us. And Jesus ends this sentence with another promise about the Spirit. He will be in you. He's speaking, though, of something that is yet to come. First, Jesus must leave. But he explains to them, John 16, verse 7, he explains to them, this is for your advantage. Jesus says to them, this is for their advantage that he would leave because if Jesus is still there, the Holy Spirit cannot be within them. That he had to leave in order for the Spirit. He had to go to the Father, ask the Father, and the Holy Spirit would then fall on those who love and obey Him. But here we find that the Holy Spirit will make a permanent home within the believer. Remember, He used the word forever. That the Spirit would have an abode 
that the Spirit would abide within true believers. And this promise transcends time to meet us here today. That for those who love Jesus Christ, for those who love Him, they will keep His commandments. Then we are promised the Holy Spirit. It is a relationship with the triune God that the Father has given to Jesus those who belong to Him, and then Jesus has given to those who belong to Him the Spirit of God that He would abide in the children of God from now on into eternity. And we know that as the church, but here's what I want to do in this moment is speak to each individual in this place. And if you want me to call you out by name, I'll start John, I'll start with Amber, I'll start with Kay, I'll start with my dad and my mom. Oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I can't remember. Allison. Allison. Now there's two of them. I'm sorry. You can slap me on the hand later. The hand. I'm going to stop there because I've just embarrassed myself. With every individual that's in this place, including myself, we we are not left to navigate through this alone. And it's hard. The troubles of this world, the grief and the sorrows, and everything that we carry thinking we have to have control. We have not been left as orphans. We have not been left fatherless. But the Father has given to us a helper to live within, to commune with our spirit. That we do not navigate the journey of faith alone. That we have been equipped. As each individual, we have been equipped. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been equipped that has enabled us to love sacrificially, to obey faithfully, and to bear witness to the truth boldly. All through the power of the Holy Spirit and as a church, let us lean into that presence. Let us lean into the Spirit. Let us rely fully on the presence of the Spirit of God. Allowing Him to shape us and to mold us into a community, into a relationship that is characterized by love. That is characterized by a love that we have for Jesus Christ and a love that then, tri- that then trickles down for a love that we have for one another. We are called to be a church that obeys wholeheartedly, following Christ's commandments to love our neighbors and to love ourselves and to make disciples of all nations. That hasn't stopped. It didn't stop in Matthew 28 when Jesus said to the disciples there. No, it carried on through the New Testament, through the centuries, through the ages to where we are right now. We are to be that church that is relying on the Holy Spirit for everything. And I might even start in business meetings when we've got questions about stuff. I might throw out that, que- that, that question back. Are we relying on the Holy Spirit for this? Wholeheartedly. So we must embrace also that promise of the Holy Spirit with open hearts and with open minds. That we live in the reality of His empowering presence. That you have a presence within you that holds the power of resurrection. Because it is that presence that has brought new life into each one of us. Even you, Allison. Never going to forget that name. And we allow Him to work through us for the glory of God and for the advancement of this kingdom. 
And so it is my prayer. The team is going to come up. We're going to close out with one more song. It is my prayer that our lives individually and our lives communally, our lives collectively would reflect that transformative power of the Holy Spirit drawing others to an abundant life that is found in Christ alone. I would ask in this moment that we would bow our heads and close our eyes. Let us go to the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, let us go to the Lord in prayer. And know that He listens. Know that He hears the cries of His children. And I know sometimes it is tough to know what to say when you are praying. But the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit is that when we don't know what to say, the Spirit prays on our behalf. That intercessor, the advocate, is praying on our behalf.